Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another con Cosmic Conversations. This is a series we host here at the Academy where we talk to people from around the field of astronomy. And today we have a very special guest, two of them. It is me and my uh, my peer here, Rook. Yep. Uh, we are planetarium presenters and uh, together we've given a couple thousand shows probably. Uh, and while we might not be uh, experts on all fields of astronomy, we're certainly experienced in the act of presenting. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We've got a couple of um, stories or questions, parts of the presenting role that uh, we'd love to, to talk about and to share. Um, so uh, I think I'm up first. Um, yeah, or unless, so yeah, so Ethan, what what question are you answering first? So as part of giving planetarium shows, we kind of open ourselves up to receiving questions from the audience. It's it's actually my favorite. I think it's probably a lot of the, our presenters' uh, favorite part of the job. The shows might be the same uh, or similar each time, but the audience is always different. And yet there are questions we get far far more than others. And I'd say several times a week, sometimes several times a day, we get one question in particular, or at least one topic. And uh, if you've given a planetarium show in the last, uh, I'm just gonna pull out a number, let's say 14 years, um, you've probably been asked about Pluto. And uh, and so that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'll talk about um, that question, uh, why, what happened to Pluto? Why isn't Pluto a planet anymore? All of that. Um, and I presume if you are, are are tuned in and you are tuned into the field of astronomy, you're probably familiar with the reason why Pluto is no longer a planet. Um, but we can go over it real quick uh, before we get to the real question, which we'll talk about in a second. So this is planetarium software called Open Space. It is developed by NASA. It's open source, totally free. You can go to uh, their website right now and download it and install it on your computer. Um, and we're leaving Earth behind so we can get a better perspective on the solar system as a whole. So this is, these are the planets in our solar system. And you'll notice that it's like particularly well organized. It feels that way at least. You've got all the planets doing these nice, neat, nearly concentric circles uh, around the sun. And these are the eight planets that we refer to as planets today. But when I was in school, way, way back when elementary school, uh, Pluto was also a planet. And I want to show you the orbit of Pluto because this is kind of where it all goes wrong. And that's that little green one there. So you'll see the rest of the planets form this nice flat disk. And then you've got Pluto doing its own thing. Uh, it doesn't really fit with the rest of the planets. We only called it a planet because this was all we really knew of in the solar system. Rather, it fit better here than with, say, the asteroids. Here are some of the asteroids. They live in here. Pluto's not really asteroid-like. But in the last 30 years in particular, we have found a ton of objects out here. So these are uh, trans-Neptunian objects, objects that are like Pluto. And um, Pluto's much more like these, or in some ways much more like these than like the planets. And so it was reclassified as a dwarf planet. Now, that is an explanation I give, again, several times a week. Um, sometimes uh, it goes better than others. Uh, but does it actually change people's thoughts about Pluto? And that's something I'm not so sure about. The real question I want to talk about is the question of like why people still ask about Pluto. Because it's been, it was 2006 when it was reclassified. And yet we still get questions like every day about it. And, and that's perplexing to me, or at least it was. But there's a couple of things that I think have contributed to this. The big one is that what's your favorite planet? When you're young is one of those questions that becomes like a part of your identity, or at least it does for a certain kind of kid. Um, I was one of that kind of kid. Um, 
I had to do a planet project in third grade, uh, and I chose Uranus for obvious reasons. Um, but there were people who chose Pluto. It was like the most popular planet because it never really played by the rules. It was a little plucky rebel. And and so a lot of people see themselves as little plucky rebels that don't quite play by the rules. And uh, and so people have their uh, this idea, right? So you've got your favorite color. You've got your favorite planet. Um, and then you hear that Pluto's no longer classified as a planet. And it's like the man coming and saying, you can't be a plucky little rebel anymore. Um, and so a rebellious thing to do is to say, actually, I think Pluto's should still be called a planet. Now, that's sort of the seed of the problem. But if that were the case, I don't feel like it would still be around today. There was one big factor that kind of blew this whole thing wide open. And it happened around the same time that Pluto got reclassified. Because it was in like fall of 2006. Well, in fall of 2006, another thing happened, which is that uh, a small social media site called Facebook went public. And I've been known to kind of blame all of the world's ails on social media. But in this case, I'm, I'm gonna, I think there is a, a true connection. Because there was a lot of folks that were making their first foray into social media. And, and how do you build your online presence? Well, there were tons and tons of groups. How do you share that you're a sports fan? Well, you can join your favorite sports teams group. Or, or maybe you like cycling. Well, there's a cycling group. But what if you're into science? What if you want to show that you really like science, but you're not like a scientist? Well, there were groups for that. And one of them, it is actually still around today, uh, is when I was your age, Pluto was a planet. Um, now, th it's small today. There's like 26,000 or whatever members. But uh, I'm I'm throwing an article, or Mary will link an article in uh in the comments um, from 2008, so two years afterwards, in which that group had 1.4 million members. Facebook at the time had like 100 million members total. So that's like almost 2%, 1.5% of all Facebook users were part of that group. Uh, so people built this as part of their identity. It was a way to kind of signal to the world that, uh, that you like science. And so today we still get questions about it because it's such a big part of 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 a particular group of people's uh I identity it's like saying you can't choose red as your favorite color anymore so i can't really blame them for that let's uh let's move on to our uh next topic this one rook is is going to talk about so i'll i'll, I'll pass it over now yeah, by the way, so as we're going on, uh, we're going to be answering some space questions that we get a lot and that we have kind of responses prepared for. If you would like to ask your own questions, though, if you would like to hear from us and get your own question answered, uh, that's a good one, for instance, what classifies as a dwarf planet? Because another thing, Ethan, I think I think you make a really good argument for why we're talking about Pluto, but I think another part of it is I remember when I was a kid, I learned what Pluto wasn't way before mm. I learned what it was. There's a lot that we discovered with the reclassification of Pluto that it doesn't really get mentioned as much as the fact that it's just not a planet anymore. Yeah, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about what makes something a dwarf planet. So in order to be a planet, you need to do three things. Um, the first is that you need to go around a star. That one's, that one's pretty easy. If you're orbiting another planet, then you're a moon. Or maybe you share your orbit with, uh, like our moon is big, but it doesn't go around the sun. So it doesn't get to be a planet. It goes around us mostly. Um, the second thing you need is you need to be round. You need to have smushed yourself into a ball. And well, we can actually go check out Pluto. Pluto is round. Uh, lots of things in the solar system are round. Our moon is round. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Pluto. So Pluto's round. That is great. Um, the third one is the tricky one. And that is, is you have to have cleared your orbit. Basically, you have to be, uh, I'm going to stop going to Pluto, actually. Let's, uh, let's get a better view of the solar system. Um, you have to have picked up everything around you. 
planets kind of form as this runaway snowball rolling down a hill kind of progress process where you start by picking up all the stuff right around you and then that makes you bigger so you pick up more stuff and a planet like earth or like any of the other planets has picked up basically everything in their orbit well pluto is like two percent of the stuff in its orbit by mass which is to say it's picked up almost none of the stuff around it it would be like in a field of snow, Earth is one giant snowball that has picked up all the snow, except for the moon, I guess. Pluto has only picked up 2% of it. There are all of these other objects out here. And if, and if Pluto were to be a planet, it would have had to have sucked up all of this stuff. Dwarf planets are objects that are big and round and go around the sun, but they haven't done that last step of picking up everything else. And so they act a little differently. They're not usually or not always as flat to the plane of the solar system and all of that. That's yeah, the big Pluto's, difference. Pluto's not our only dwarf planet either. So we're talking about dwarf planets as being things that go around the sun and the round, and they meet all the criteria of being a planet, except that they're surrounded by other stuff. We have another example of that much closer to home. Our largest asteroid, Ceres, is actually also a dwarf planet in and of itself. So there's a dwarf planet pretty close to Earth, right in the asteroid belt. And this is kind of going on a tangent, but it actually did the same thing Pluto did, which is when we first found it, we called it a planet. Uh, for this time, it wasn't you know ninety years or whatever, but it was it was for like a a year or so until we found another asteroid and then another one and another one and another one. We said, okay, so this is not actually a planet. This is just an asteroid. And Ceres actually got upgraded. I I shouldn't say that. It it got reclassified too as a dwarf planet. So it went the other way. But a part of the reason they didn't call Ceres an asteroid when they first found it is because there weren't asteroids yet. Like we didn't know asteroids existed. Ceres was the very first thing in that belt that we found. So yeah, one, one final thing, analogy, sorry. Yeah. So the same thing that happens with Pluto. It's not a planet anymore because we found out what it was. And we also found out a whole different part of our solar system that we had no idea existed. Yeah, building off that, um, an, an analogy uh, is like, orcas. So if you're familiar with orcas, they were once called killer whales, still are. Um, when we first found them, I presumably we called them whales because they were big and black. <laughs> and that was kind of it. They had the same coloration. Now we know that they're way more closely uh, related to dolphins. They have a similar lifestyle. They eat similar things. They're both intelligent. They, they are closer genetically related, all of that jazz. So we classify them closer to dolphins now. We're not going to go back to calling them whales just because that's what we did when we didn't have the most information. And if there's a, a huge, um, yeah, uh, a huge movement to get killer whales reinstated as a, a whale, uh, I don't think it will get the scientific backing um, that maybe, maybe they're hoping for. And yeah, Pluto does it, Pluto's gone nowhere. It's still out there. You're welcome to call it whatever you want at the end of the day. Uh, it, it really doesn't care. So let's go on to our second topic. Yeah, absolutely. So I also have an answer to a question that I get every now and then. Um, and I wanted to do this one in particular because this is a question that ends up touching on some of my favorite stuff that we encounter working in a planetarium. So every now and then during our shows, as we're taking you all through space, we will leave our solar system behind, we'll leave the nearby stars behind, and we will even leave the galaxy itself behind to get this beautiful kind of cosmic bird's eye view of our Milky Way galaxy. Except there's one small problem with this image that we're looking at here, it's that we can't actually see the Milky Way galaxy from this angle not at all. So in order to have gotten a photograph of the galaxy from out here, we would have have to have gotten a camera all the way out here. Furthest an Earth camera has ever gone is not even outside the solar system. So that means it's a bit of a problem when it comes to representing the Milky Way. We have this beautiful model that I'm showing you here, but it's not a photograph. It's not a picture we've actually taken of the Milky Way. And we don't know for sure what our entire galaxy looks like. So 
how do we create this representation of it if we know so little about the galaxy and if we've never really had this view before? Well, turns out there is a lot that we do know about the Milky Way, even from our position deep, deep inside of it. For instance, you can see the Milky Way from Earth, just not from this angle. So if we cruise back a bit closer to home, and if you decide to look up on a clear night, pretty much everything you see is likely to be a part of the Milky Way. There are one or two rare exceptions I'll just talk about in a moment, but all the stars you see in the sky, any planets you might catch in the sky, all of those are a part of our Milky Way galaxy. And if you're in a particularly dark area on a particularly clear night, you might also get this view across the sky. So here within the Milky Way, we can actually look across that big spiral disk that we were talking about. So you're looking at our galaxy as we look here. Here we're seeing the bright center of the galaxy. We're seeing all that gas and dust. But um, I know my colleague Josh has a favorite analogy. It's kind of like we've got our heads stuck in a tire. We can see the inside of the tire really well. We can see below the tire. We can see above the tire. Seeing the entire tire, however, or anything beyond it, is a bit of a tall order. Now, that's not to say people haven't been trying to map the Milky Way galaxy for quite a long time. So one of our first efforts to make a map of the galaxy and what was then called the known universe uh, comes to us from the astronomer Sir William Herschel, who in 1785 came up with this. Now, he created this map using a method called star gauging. What he did was he took his telescope to 600 different locations around the planet and he counted stars. Now, this actually got him pretty far. So you can see in this map, all these little dots represent stars. And he was able to try and guess how far away a, a particular star was by looking at its brightness, assuming stars that were brighter would be closer and stars that were dimmer would be further away. Doing that, he did get uh, some pretty good data on things about the Milky Way galaxy that we still know to be true. For instance, he was able to observe that it is a disk. All the stars around him were kind of clustered together into this flat disk shape. But you'll notice here in our model, there is a dark spot kind of right in the center of Herschel's map. Uh, that dark spot was where he noted the location of our solar system and our planet right there in the center of the galaxy. And I've got bad news for Herschel and bad news for you. We are not actually in the center of the galaxy. Uh, so why does it look like we are using Herschel's map? Well, part of the reason for that is because he wasn't actually able to see the whole galaxy. As Herschel was looking at stars, he was looking at really only a very small part of our Milky Way. He wasn't even able to see the edge of it. And that's because Many stars in the Milky Way are just too distant, too dim, or too shrouded in all of that gas and dust for us to be able to observe them. And he also would have run into a smaller problem, uh, relatively speaking, uh, by how he gauged the star's distance. He assumed that all stars were the same brightness by default. So if a star looked brighter, it must be because it's closer. In reality, some stars might be much, much brighter than others. So if a star looks particularly bright, it might be really close or it might just be really, really bright. That, however, is not uh, nearly as big of a problem as the problem of how limited Herschel's view was. The fact that there are so many stars in the Milky Way, he just couldn't see. Good news is uh, the problem of not being able to see stars in the Milky Way is one that is completely and 100% solved. And we now know what the whole thing looks like, right, Ethan? Of course, because we've flown our camera out into space, right? Yeah. No, unfortunately not. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of the Milky Way we can't see. So we still don't quite have a full map of it. But the good news is we're getting a lot closer. So compare Herschel's map to a much more recent one from the OGLE project. This is one of our most recent maps of our Milky Way galaxy as we've been able to chart it so far. And this, this is pretty good. Compared to Herschel's map, which would have been just one small chunk of the galaxy, this is quite a lot of it. We can see um, stars clustered in that greater shape of the Milky Way, clustered in these spiral arms 
some of the most iconic features of our galaxy features you see represented in that model, we can also find in data sets like this. So we definitely know some things about the Milky Way for sure. We know that we are indeed a spiral galaxy. We know that it's a more or less flat disk and that those stars are clustered in these big spiral whirlpool looking arms. And we also have one more secret weapon when it comes to figuring out what our galaxy looks like. So arguably one of the most important things we've learned about our galaxy since Herschel's day is the fact that it isn't actually the known universe. The Milky Way galaxy is not the only one. In fact, there are other spiral galaxies around us that we can use to get an idea of what our galaxy looks like. So this, for instance, is a photograph. This is a photograph taken from Earth. Might look pretty familiar. This isn't the Milky Way though, even though it looks a lot like our model right here. This is an object called M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. It's kind of our next door neighbor galactically speaking. Uh, so we know that both the Milky Way and Andromeda are spiral galaxies. Based on all the other spiral galaxies we've seen around us, and we've seen quite a few, we know they share many characteristics in common. And even though there are differences between Andromeda and the Milky Way, we think Andromeda is quite a bit bigger, for instance, um, it's a pretty safe bet to assume that if we find characteristics in Andromeda, if Andromeda looks a particular way, the Milky Way probably looks very similar. And so that is where we land on this model right here. It's an artistic representation, yes, but it doesn't just come from nowhere. It's a collaboration between art and science, using all of the information that we have about our galaxy and using imagination just to fill in the few gaps that remain. And even though we don't yet have the galaxy mapped, if you compare where we started to where we are now, I think we're doing a pretty good job. It's a little bit like um, like those AI generated faces. Like it's, we can see how many more galaxies than you could ever count. Uh, and, and even if we can't see our own, we know enough about how they look to inform what we think we should look like. Like even if you never had a mirror, if you could see every human being on Earth, you'd have a pretty good idea of what you looked like based on even just the little bits you can see about yourself. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we might not have the the minute features of the Milky Way, but you know, we know it's got two eyes and a nose and a mouth. You know, using your analogy, like we know the sort of broad strokes, so we can see that big cluster in the center, that those old bright stars in the center, and the spiral arms. What is the gas dust stuff? All right, that's a wonderful question. That actually might be something we can get a better view of if we cruise back on in to get our view of the Milky Way that we do have from Earth. Uh, so that gas and dust is actually kind of all over the galaxy. You don't often find it as condensed as it appears here. From this angle, we are actually looking through an entire galaxy's worth of gas and dust. So most of it can be spread out. But Ethan, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the same kind of material you find in sort of clumps of clouds and gas like nebula. Yeah, so um, we tend to think of our galaxy as being made of stars because that's the part of it that we can see because stars are bright. Uh, but just like how we thought our solar system was just planets way back in the day, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that makes up our galaxy. And this dust and gas is the same stuff you'd find in say a star or say in planet Earth, um, or in a nebula, which is like a big cloud of stuff that is just sort of accumulated. It's like a cosmic dust bunny. Now here, it looks pretty dark. It looks thick. I mean, it blocks the light from the hundreds of millions of stars. But it's if you were to go to that little patch of space, where from here it looks like there's you know these solid blocks of dust and gas, and you chose you know your square meter or square yard if you're imperial, um, and you counted how much dust was in it, it's barely more than you would find elsewhere. It's you know a couple of particles per cubic meter more than the galactic average. So this stuff's everywhere. 
But when we're looking over such big distances, it all adds up to block out light. And yeah. it's as much a part of the galaxy as like stars are or as we are. And it's just around. We just can't see it without having a light behind it. A good comparison we in San Francisco are probably very, very used to is it's a lot like fog. If you're looking at fog across an empty field or you're staring out at fog across the bay, it will completely obscure what's on the other side. But even though the same fog might be around you, it's not going to obscure something that's 10 feet away. Sometimes here at San Most Francisco it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just like fog is a part of San Francisco, dust it gets. Yeah, it does part of it, yep. Favorite space analogy. Oh, hmm. uh, one I find myself using a lot is talking about uh, distance in terms of time. So here, I'll, I'll um, this, this uh, will, um, we actually use it like scientifically, but uh, so the distance from say the earth to the moon, if you're traveling at the speed of light, it takes about one and a half seconds. So it takes you one and a half seconds at light speed to get there. Um, that's you know this distance cosmically. It's two hundred and forty thousand miles, which is just straight up gobbledygook. Like I can't make sense of of that number. Um, but for some reason, like one and a half seconds is a lot easier. Uh, and when we're talking about say the distance to the sun, the sun is a hundred million miles, which is a lot more than 250,000, but for some reason my brain can't parse that. But it is eight minutes, eight and a half at the speed of light. So one and a half seconds is like that amount of time, one and a half seconds, whereas eight and a half minutes is a lot longer. And then when we're talking about the next closest star. So the next closest star, Alpha Centauri, is um, four light years. So like the jump from seconds to minutes is like palatable. Uh, the jump from minutes to years is uh, a lot farther. <laughs> it's like a, your orientation versus, you know, your whole sort of four-year college experience in theory, if that exists anymore. I Rook, do you have a also, favorite analogy? This might be what we have to close out the show with. We're, we're getting to that time. <laughs> I don't know about a favorite analogy, but actually there, I, I do see a question that actually lends itself really well to what you were talking about, which is, uh, why can't you just, if you're trying to see the Milky Way, send something further to see more? The answer is you totally can. We've technically sent something out past the solar system into the galaxy. We've sent the Voyager probes. Uh, they are, in Ethan's terms, uh, using sort of light uh, hours. So the Voyager probes are about 19, 20 light hours away at this point. So they've they've gone the distance that it would take uh, that light would travel if you gave it 19 hours. Uh, it took them about 50 years to get there. Yeah, they are about where the camera is in this. We are about one light day from uh, from the sun. They're about here. Uh, so <laughs> if we want to get to the next closest star, it's um, it's a it it's it's a lot farther. Yeah. So we say yeah. So our our closest neighbor in space is uh, four light years away. So it would take light, the fastest known thing in the universe, four years to get there. It would take you four years to get there if you're traveling at the speed of light, but so far we can't do that. Uh, to send a spacecraft out just to the next star would probably take centuries. Yeah, generations. So like if you left, you wouldn't get there. Your kids wouldn't get there. Your kids' kids wouldn't get there. I mean, it so yeah, so yeah, you you can send stuff into the galaxy. There's nothing stopping you. It's just a matter of how long you want to wait. Yeah. All right. So we have hit about 30 minutes. Mary, is there any last questions you think we can tackle? Ooh. Um what is hey, dark? You want to take this one? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh so there's two ways we can guess the size. Oh, we've been given permission to go longer. So we can we can drag this out. Ooh. Uh, 
<laughs> That's dangerous. Yeah, Cosmic Conversations is apparently a, a series that can go a little longer. So there's kind of a, a couple of ways we can guess how big, say, a galaxy is, or how, how we can measure how heavy a galaxy is. Um, so the first is by just looking at it. Even though, as I mentioned before, there's lots of stuff in a galaxy. Um, you know, there's stars, there's planets, there's dust. Most of the mass of a galaxy, most of the stuff in it, that is stars. So if we see a galaxy, we can see how bright it is. We know how much it should weigh, um, just based on that. And you know, we can add in dust is whatever a couple of percent of the mass of a galaxy. I don't. That's just ballparking. Don't quote me. But uh, we can we can accommodate for that. So we can get some estimate for how how heavy a galaxy should be just by looking at how much how bright it is, how much stuff should be there visually. There's another way too, and that is we can use gravity. The heavier something is, the faster things orbit it. And galaxies are a bunch of stars moving around. If we can track how those galaxies are spinning, or maybe it's groups of galaxies all moving together around each other, we can tell how heavy they are based on how gravity is causing them to move or the things in them to move. So we've got two different ways to estimate it. The problem is they don't match. Whoops, this way. The ones that we see are like consistently, our estimates for how much stuff we think should be there is like one seventh the amount that gravity is telling us is there. So we've got a problem and that is either we don't understand how gravity works. We understand how gravity works. General relativity, the theories around it are like the second most successful, most proved, repeatedly proved scientific theory of all time. Um, so that must mean that there's something there that we're not seeing, something that is making up the rest of that galaxy. There must be something there that we're not seeing that is incredibly heavy, but it's nothing that we know of. So what do we know about it? We know it has mass, we know it's heavy, it warps gravity, and uh, we know it doesn't interact with light or be able to see it. Um, so we call it dark and it's mass, it, it, or it's matter, it has mass. Um, so we call it dark matter. And the only other thing we know about it is, well, we can tell generally where it is in, in the universe. Um, but we know it's nothing that we have run into before. So, you know, when I first learned about dark matter, my first thought was like, well, what about black holes? Those are dark. We don't see them. They have gravity. Well, it turns out there, <laughs> there shouldn't be enough black holes. There aren't enough black holes to make this work. Um, we know that it's not any sort of compact object like a planet or, d d you know, burned out stars or anything that we've heard of so far in all of our experiments. Um, so it's some new form of matter. Um, there are some candidates out there, like, uh, you know, particular particles or things within the standard model or on the fringes of the standard model. But like, it's it's nothing that I had ever heard of uh, the current theory. So it's some other kind of matter. And we know it's out there because it's warping space and the universe we know would have just flown apart or the universe we see would have flown apart without it. Yeah. And when you say when you say it doesn't interact with light, usually when we think of things that are dark, we think of things absorbing light. So for instance, black holes would appear black because they're absorbing all of the light. So does dark matter not absorb light either? No. Uh, the, the only way it interacts with light is gravitationally. So like it'll cause things light to change its course if there's something if because it's there. Uh, but it, it doesn't absorb it. It doesn't emit it. Uh, it's it's not black because that's something. It's just nothing to light. It, light just goes straight through it. Um, so yeah, we're at kind of a loss. And by we, I don't mean me, but I, I mean, I mean me, but science in, in general. Um, we know a uh, lots of things that it isn't, which is closer to knowing what it is a little bit. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where it's like when we talk about you know the discovery of Ceres, the asteroid belt, Pluto, the you know the Kuiper belt and transneptunian objects. It's really easy to think that there are like we have it all figured out that we're never going to make those same mistakes again. There are definitely things that we are still talking about in astronomy that are going to have to go through a Pluto situation eventually. It's <laughs> yes. kind of how science works. <laughs> Hopefully people haven't built those things into their Facebook profiles, though. <laughs> um, OK, let's uh, let's do I, I prep some resources to talk about uh, 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 another thing that comes up all the time, which is names in astronomy. 
So these are, we get questions about it all the time and kind of in two flavors. One is the like, why are things named just random strings of numbers and letters? And and the, that one's pretty straightforward. Like there are too many things in space to give them all good names or, or not good names, names humans find interesting. Um, like Aldebaran and Betelgeuse and, you know, Nix, all these cool names that humans make a lot of sense of. Well, there aren't enough words in like all the dictionaries that we have to name things. Um, and computers are the ones kind of naming them at this point. Um, they aren't just random strings. They give a lot of information. Their names have a lot of information. Um, and if you work in programming, you usually end up renaming strings of letters into numbers so that your computer can handle it better. You can work with big databases. That's how astronomy is done nowadays. It's so much more useful to have names that have information rather than names that humans find appealing. The other direction we talk about names is in regards to a single object, which is Uranus or Uranus. Um, for obvious reasons, uh, it's silly sounding when uh, spoken by it you know, in the context of the English language. Uh, but the story of how it got its name is actually way more interesting than that. Um, it's something that I just kind of, you know, stu stumbled across is maybe not the right word, but in looking for, you know, why is it named what it's named? Um, it has a fascinating story and, uh, and it all boils down to, it teaches us some really interesting lessons about how astronomy works. Um, so Uranus or Uranus, uh, is a Greek word, which kind of breaks the trend from, from the rest of the solar system. But more importantly, it is the first planet that we discovered basically since antiquity. So uh, before this, before the discovery of Uranus, which was done by William Herschel, we'll talk about Herschel a lot, um, every other planet was visible to the naked eye. So they had names from like every culture that could see them, they would give them names. Um, so when we when it came time to name them or to decide what astronomy was going to call them, you know, people would look at what their favorites were. Uh, the names we use today for like Mercury or they're Roman. Um, Europeans like Roman history because it's uh, by a culture that aligns with theirs in a lot of ways. Um, not going to open that can of worms. But um, Uranus was discovered after that by William Herschel uh, using a telescope that looked like this. Um, and uh, it was not actually the first time it was seen. It had been seen before, but it was it, he was the first person to kind of recognize that it was not just a star, that it was a planet. And so he had this problem of like, what do we name it? So he... Uh, he had something to say on it. He, you know, this was the time when people wrote letters to all over each other. Um, so this is some, wow, that's right over my face, huh? Um, this was a, 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 a quote that he wrote to someone else. Um, and um, I'll read it aloud. You're welcome to read it too. This is from Wikipedia. You could also just Wikipedia year in his name. But um, in the fabulous ages of ancient times, the appellations of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were given to the planets as being the names of their principal heroes and divinities. Basically what he's saying is, you know, they named these after their own heroes, the greatest and most important people. In the present, more philosophical era, it would hardly be allowable to have recourse to do the same method and call it Juno, Pallas, Apollo, or Minerva for a name for our new heavenly body. The first consideration of any particular event or remarkable incident seems to be its chronology. In any future age, it should be asked when this last found planet was discovered. It would be a very satisfactory answer to say, in the reign of King George III. And so he went on to say that this plant, this new thing should be called Georgium Citus, or in other words, George's star or the Georgian planet. So Uranus was almost named George, which is just like mind blowing to me. It's also horribly ironic that um, Juno, Pallas, Apollo, and Minerva are names of celestial objects. Um, Juno and Pallas in particular are, are objects that, that have names. Uh, 
so he almost named this George's star or, you know, George, Georgium Citus, whatever. But he wrote around a bunch of people said like, no, please don't do that. There's another factor here that he leaves out there. And that is that King George the third was his patron. In other words, King George was paying his bills. So, and like the greatest suck up move in all of astronomy, he almost named Uranus after it. But of course, Uranus has its name now. Uh, Ironically, it comes from Greek instead of Roman, like the rest of the objects. Uh, Uranos is like the, the god of, or the titan or the deity, whatever, of of the sky. Uh, and is like the father to Kronos, uh, who is the father to Zeus. Jupiter is Zeus in Roman mythology. His father is Saturn, and his father is... Uh, the uh, the equivalent of Uranus. So there was kind of this cool progression of like each planet further out is 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 their father. Um, that doesn't work with Neptune though. We didn't know it existed. Once again, we made that mistake. But there were some other names thrown around. So the thought was maybe we should name this planet Herschel. Uh, there was one. It was proposed to be called Neptune actually, uh, which is which is a fun one. Um, yeah. But so it has this interesting naming story where it was almost named George uh, because it was the first one that needed a name. Cool. Let's uh, let's hop over. Let's let uh, Rook do their last uh, the last little bit. Or, or sorry, do we have any questions about it? Uh, yeah. I do see one question. Uh, I do believe there might be. A little bit of translation software at work here, but thank you very much for tuning into the show. I hope you're enjoying. Uh, I am inferring this is why is Venus hotter than Mercury despite being further from the sun, uh, which is a wonderful and very cool question. Uh, the reason Venus is hotter than Mercury despite being further from the sun is the same reason we're a little bit worried about Earth right now. Uh, Venus's atmosphere is 94% carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. That means that as light and energy come in from the sun, they get trapped by gases like carbon dioxide. Now, for perspective, Earth's atmosphere is about 0.04% carbon dioxide. So Venus has some global warming going on on a very cosmic scale. Its atmosphere is mostly greenhouse gas, and that means that its warming effect is intense. So even though Mercury is right next to the sun, absorbing more energy, Mercury doesn't really have an atmosphere to speak of. As soon as that energy goes away, it just disperses into space. Venus, however, is collecting it, keeping it nice and safe under the atmosphere as it builds and builds and builds, getting even hotter than the surface of Mercury in most places. I think there are like, there are a couple locations you can find on Mercury that are hotter than the hottest locations on Venus. But by and large, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. We used to think Venus was maybe like a paradise, right? Because like the tropics are the places of Earth that get the most light and or the most direct sunlight, and they have you know they're these beautiful, lush, vibrant places. And Venus was shrouded in clouds, so maybe it's a really nice place. It's like all tropics all over the place. And then we sent a spacecraft there and it melted and like, oops. And it's, it like rains acid from the sky. It's like a terrible, no good nightmare place. Don't go to Venus. Yeah, that's another good one. It's like, you know, Venus looks beautiful in the sky. It's one of the brightest objects in the sky when it's out. Um, the third brightest. Because it is, uh, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> I don't count the sun and moon, but you're right, I should. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, um, it's because it's close, it's because it's pretty big, and it's also because it's covered in sulfuric acid clouds, which are very reflective. So it looks beautiful and bright and sparkly because of all that sulfuric acid. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, don't don't go. Yeah, Venus is hardcore. <laughs> uh, our spacecraft, we don't send rovers to Venus. We send la landers, and sometimes they make it to the surface. Um, do you want to do your uh, a, another topic, Rook? Yeah, I can close this out uh, real fast. If you have any final questions, this is definitely the time to ask them. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to actually cruise back over to our planet. And we're going to talk about, so I, 
We've been discussing some great mysteries where space is concerned. I'm actually going to talk about one of the most familiar objects uh, outside of our own planet. So we're going to cruise over to Earth, taking the long route, because I want to discuss Earth's uh, largest satellite, our moon. Now the moon is indeed a satellite. We use the word satellite to describe anything going around a planet, whether people made it or not. So our moon is a satellite, even though people didn't make it. And it is indeed the largest one. So You're really going to get on me about the third brightest object in the sky and then <laughs> say that the moon is Earth's largest satellite? <laughs> I, I, I did say one of. I, to defend myself, I said Venus was one of the brightest objects in the sky. Okay. <laughs> there are plenty of reasons I can get on you about that one. <laughs> All right. Here we have our moon, and it is one of the most familiar objects. It's really the only other body in space besides Earth that we can see in detail with the naked eye from the surface of our planet. As we look up at the moon, we can actually see things that we see on Earth. We can see mountains, we can see craters, we can see valleys. It's pretty exciting to be able to see all of those things on Earth something that isn't our own planet, and to be able to do it almost every evening. So that means that we're really familiar with at least one side of Earth, or at least one side of the moon, rather. But because of a phenomenon called tidal locking, we only actually ever see one face of the moon from our planet. So as we look up at the moon, this is the face that you're always going to see. Sometimes more of it might be lit up, sometimes less of it might be lit up, but regardless of how much shadow is covering it, you're always looking at this, the near side of the moon. Because the near side of the moon is always facing towards Earth as the moon spins around. So that's why we call it tidally locked. One face always faces towards us, one face always faces away. That means there's one half of the moon that we never get to see from the surface of our own planet. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you it now. We're gonna venture over to the mysterious far side of the moon. Do you mean dark side of the moon? I do not mean dark side <laughs> of the moon. And I also get questions about how we know what the far side of the moon looks like. But for instance, here we can see it in great detail. These are actual photos of the far side of the moon. Remember how I said that the uh, near side of the moon is always pointed towards us? Well, that means that if the near side of the moon is pointed towards us and it's completely covered in shadow, it's a new moon and you can't see it at all, then one half of the moon must be covered in light. So if the near side of the moon is covered in shadow, the far side is completely lit up. It's not constantly dark, just like the near side isn't constantly light. So you might also notice as we're looking at the far side that it's a lot less familiar for a couple reasons, not just because we rarely ever see it, um, we'd have to leave our own planet to do so, but because it looks really different than the near side of the moon does. The near side of the moon has all of these huge dark features called mare. And so the maria are uh, these big shapes on the moon which look darker, smoother, flatter, and we've been looking at them for a really long time. There is a whole bunch of mythology built up around the sort of shapes and forms that they take. If you've heard of the man on, in the moon, or you're familiar with the moon rabbit legend, then this is why. These shapes create all of those iconic figures on the surface of the moon, these big, dark, flat areas. Now, the word we use to describe them, mare, means sea because when they were discovered, it was thought that these might be huge bodies of water. We know now that they are not bodies of water, but if we look a little bit closer, it's easy to see why somebody might have thought so. Because indeed, if we go to the one of the mare and we head over to what you might consider the coastline, it does actually kind of look like a coastline. It almost seems to flow around the edges of that shape creating things like a coast, cliffs, islands. It looks very much like an ocean. And that's because in the distant past, it actually was not an ocean of water, mind you, but an ocean of molten rock. So 
here you can see within this ocean, uh, uh, or rather discuss how this get, gets, gets here, how, the, how an, ocean of, uh, an ocean of molten rock gets on the surface of the moon. We've got to look at how the moon formed. It's easy to think as we look at the moon that there are no more mysteries to find out about it, that we have uh, a good idea of how all of it works, how all of it functions, how all of it came to be, but there's still a lot of questions that we have about the moon surface. And this is one that I think has one of the most interesting answers I have heard to explain why it's the case. Now, back in the distant past, the solar system would have been really different than it is now. When the Earth and the Moon got started, you need to understand two things about our solar system. It would have been a very hot and a very violent place to be. So that means the Earth and the Moon would have looked very different. This is a uh, an interpretation from Mark Garlick, who imagined uh, these two objects at their very start. So they would have been functionally two big molten blobs of rock in space. You'll also notice that here, the Earth and the Moon are much closer together. They would have started off a lot closer, and the Moon's been drifting away from us a little by little since then. You're not going to notice this happening. Don't worry, the Moon's not going anywhere fast. But they would have started much closer together than they are today. That means we've got two molten balls of rock right next to each other. And over time, they would have cooled, creating the rocky crusts we see now. Now, in the midst of this process, while the moon was still cooling down, underneath, much of it would have still been molten. Today, we think the moon is pretty solid, more or less solid. If there's still liquid lunar material, you'd probably have to go pretty deep down to find it. But the crust back then would have been thinner. Thin enough that the constant asteroid impacts happening during that time might have been enough to punch through that thin crust, or at the very least, weaken it enough for magma to flow through, flow up, and flow in to the craters. So if we look at our Maria again, you'll notice a lot of them are framed by what appear to be almost perfect circles. So we can see that they flowed into impact craters, and it could be these very impacts that led to those huge lava flows emerging onto the surface. But why is this happening on one side more than it's happening on the other? Well, remember, the moon isn't the only molten ball of rock around. The moon would have been cooling down. The Earth would have been cooling down too, but much more slowly. Because the moon is small and small things cool more quickly, it would have gotten cooler much faster than the Earth did. It would have started to cool down and solidify while the Earth next to it was still a giant molten furnace. So that means that the space of the moon that's always pointed towards Earth might have actually been warmed up by that furnace. It might have been able to have been kept warm by the still cooling blob of magma that was our planet. That means that the crust on the far side of the moon got thicker faster. The crust on the near side of the moon stayed pretty thin. So the Mari that we see might have been a result of our planet influencing the moon, heating it up so that those asteroid impacts could still reach magma that flowed across its surface, creating the shapes we know to be so familiar today. We, uh, for the 50th year anniversary of the Apollo missions to the moon, we did a whole show about it. And, you know, I had always thought, like, why would we care about the moon when, like, Mars exists and like Pluto is so fascinating and there's so many cool things in space. The moon's just like the moon, you know, but the more we've learned about it, the more, sorry, we, the more I have learned about it, the more I've been kind of just astounded at how bizarre it is and and, and how many mysteries we still have. And it's really in, in light or in emboldening and, in, and exciting that like, there's still so much we don't know about something we know a whole lot about. Uh, and and that's, you know, astronomy is so cool. It's the yeah. only science where like, you can just be like, well, what is that? And that's like valid, uh, valid uh, science. Yeah, you can count me in that camp where it's, if, if you would ask me like, you know, name some places in the solar system that have really interesting geology, moon would not have been in my top 10. 
Um, yes, I could have found more places than planets before I got to the moon. Uh, but the more I've learned about it, yeah, it's incredible. There are strange flat shield volcanoes. There are collapsed lava tubes. There are there's evidence of like strange magnetic fields. There might be liquid water. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, open space has a very, very good moon model. So if, if you want to go check out kind of the moon yourself, uh, it is a fantastic tool to do it. You know, you can really get a sense for, for the, the texture of it as well. Um, okay, let's give a little bit of space for any last questions. I've been looking at the chat. It, uh, it doesn't seem like there's a huge amount. Um, We'll give a, 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 a minute or two left for that. Um, Rook, do you want to read off what other uh, shows are happening in the schedule? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have shows going on pretty much all week. Um, you can correct me if I miss any, but I know that in the mornings at uh, Tuesday at around 9.30, we have a stream with Mary, who today is behind the scenes helping us produce, uh, geared towards younger audiences. Uh, I know this is sometimes Shine and Seek and sometimes Moon Explorers. Uh, either way, it's a really fun time. Uh, so if you have younger members of your family who might enjoy that show, that's Tuesday mornings at 9.30. Wednesdays at 4.30 in the afternoon, uh, Ethan will be back with you uh, helping Josh do a tour of the solar system. So uh, that will show you all around the solar system. You have more questions about the planets in particular or about various moons, even about Pluto if you're not yet satisfied, uh, you can head over in that direction. Uh, that's a fun show, it usually takes a lot of questions. Thursdays at uh, 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, myself and Bing give you night sky update. Uh, that is an update of all the things that you can see from Earth looking up at the sky, what you can expect to find in the sky that evening or throughout next week. Uh, we discuss things like meteor showers, uh, the International Space Station, and when you can see it, which I do recommend finding it if you can. Um, it's really cool to watch in the sky. You can find it at Spot the Station, I think, uh, .nasa.gov. And uh, other sort of events that you can find looking up in the sky, what stars you can see, what planets you can see. And then finally, Fridays uh, is always Cosmic Conversations at 1130 when we join for today. Uh, typically, that will be an interview with an expert, whether it's the dubious experts in answering space questions or um, <laughs> experts in their field who can discuss their current research on recent topics have been asteroids, the sun, exoplanets. It's really, really interesting. And of course, all of this is uh, through our, or visible on our Facebook page. Um, so if you are watching us on Facebook, you're probably already there. And if you're on YouTube, you can make your way there. It's uh, facebook.com slash Morrison Planetarium, all one word. Uh, and that will have, you know, all the, the events. Um, if you, like me, just kind of fuzz over when anyone tells you anything about future events that are more than 24 hours away. And, and yeah, so the calendar will all be uh, on our Facebook page. Yeah. Um, I think that's just about it for us. Thank you so much for, for joining us for this uh, cosmic conversation. Oh, and this is a good way to end it. What would I name a new planet? Um, I would, of course, name it after myself because, uh, <laughs> because Coming close to George uh, would have been a, 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 a triumph for George's everywhere. I'd like to give back to the Ethan community. <laughs> uh, I look. I want to give. I want to give a, a much better answer to this. <laughs> but I uh, grew up being very fond of Greek mythology in particular. I understand Roman mythology is not the same thing. It is still the case, though, that I will die mad that they never got around to Minerva or Diana for any planets. <laughs> so, uh, 
That, that's our answers to that. And that is the end of this converse, cosmic conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it. I hope you stay safe in these uh, difficult times and uh, be well. <laughs>